got some great names up there. You got some great people up there. And, and, and let's not forget about Carl Cox. King Cox. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think um, every artist is important to have a relationship with your fans because they're the ones that support you and and keep you relevant. I don't think any artist would be anyone without their fans. You don't wake up a star or you know famous. Um, it's your fans that give you that title. So it's important to give back to your fans because they're the ones that you need the support from. You know, today we're talking about the world of social media where you have a, you have a broader platform to, to communicate w with your fans, like instantaneous almost, you know what I mean? Um, which is a good and a bad thing uh, uh, at the same time, but it's important because you're important to them. So it's almost like what social media has become is really to in, be more involved with your fans. One of the main things that a lot of DJs lack today is the knowledge of sound. And sound is a very important part of being a DJ. I mean, it's different, there's different levels of what a DJ should know. But the first thing is how to, first, how to enjoy music. First, you have to enjoy music. You have to love records. You have to, you have to, you have to love to shop. You have, you know what I mean? Um, that you live and breathe music. I mean, this is what I know. This is, this is, this is school 101. A lot of people don't know quality of sound. Um, in making records, in listening to records, in how they play records, in how they use a, in how they use a mixer. Um, everything is not just about playing in the red, you know, or playing too loud. You know what I'm saying? You, you, know, you have to know how to manipulate, you know what I mean? And there's not, when it comes to the new generation, unfortunately, the majority of them don't know about sound at all. And there is a difference when someone that understands sound um, gets on the sound system. Well, um, well, you're gonna ask me something. I can't talk about bad about Pioneer. Of course not. <laughs> I mean, um, I I like Pioneer. I'm actually waiting for them to send me a sound system next week to to try out. Uh, you know, the original Pioneer component is a TAD driver, which is one of the most um, best drivers out there that a lot of people really don't know. You know what I mean? I like their sound system. I love their CDJs. I'm not a fan of fader mixers, so I don't use a Pioneer fader mixer. Not because I don't like the mixer, I just don't like faders, so I think Pioneer is a good product, and I'm a I'm a big supporter of Pioneer. My technical setup is four CDJs. I normally bring my own mixer, which is an ARS mixer, whether it could be the 9000, the 6700, or the 4100. There's three different models. And I use a dope wheel isolator as well. And that's pretty much my setup. And of course, I have in my rider monitors. My monitors have to be good monitors. I have to have what I need to feel comfortable to give a better performance per se. Because if I'm not feeling it, trust me, nobody is. There's two top, re I'll say three. One is, one is Jamiroquai because I made a song out of something that wasn't really a song. It was a different tempo. It was another jam session. It, it, it was like, it, it, it was amazing, but it, it's different. 
It's like if you take the remix and the original, it really doesn't match the way the lyrics are, the way the chorus, the verse, the chorus. It was never so... The, of course, that became his biggest record. Second one will have to be Mariah Carey, Dream Lover, because that was the first time that we bought, that the vocalist came in, the singer came in to re-sing the record because it was a pop record, and we did something different with it. Um, we rewrote the chords, we rewrote the melody practically, you know? And then third one is Mr. Loverman by Shaba Ranks, which a lot of people don't know. When I tell people, you know, you know, I make a Mr. Loverman, yeah, I did that. They go, really? No, it's like, duh. Um, that one, because that was, uh, that was a dance hall record. And they actually changed the name because it wasn't, the name wasn't Mr. Loverman, it was called Champion Lover, but because I, I, I changed the hook of the record. Um, so those three are probably my top f for creativity because I actually changed everything that had nothing to do with the original. And of course, over the years, I mean, working with Seal was amazing. Donna Summer was amazing. Um, and Nesby from The Sounds of Blackness. Uh, you know, I've got to work with some really amazing, I even work with Julio Iglesias, which is amazing. <laughs> and people may laugh, oh, Julio Iglesias, but man, it's like, you're talking about icons. You're going about some of the greatest singers. We're not talking about somebody that just goes boo, boo, boo. We're talking about legends here. Oh, and Aretha Franklin, another one. How can I forget Aretha Franklin? My next one on my list is Patti LaBelle. We got together when I was on Ultra Records and she did a record called, called Believe. And then um, we sort of like lost communication for a while. But I always wanted to work for her because she's a great songwriter and I love her voice. But she was going through some, you know, personal issues and stuff. So she wasn't in the right place, you know, to get together. So, but I always kept pushing, I always kept pushing. And I did this record, and I played the track that was for They Must Be Love at Ministry of Sound. It was on, on, like in December, right before Christmas. And it was it's such an instant hit, the marriage of the track and the vocals. So I went to Japan after that, and I was like, wow, I have to make a record with a new vocal on this, because I really just made something for me to play. And I told Janice, I have this record, and I want to feel your pain, is exactly what I said. And she sent me back the demo to There Must Be Love, and it was before my set in Tokyo, and I was into it on my iPhone, and I cried. I was like, I asked to feel your pain. I was like, but what is this? I was like, this is amazing. Ever since then, that's how There Must Be Love came out, and you know, it was it was an instant record because I actually first played the finished version of There Must Be Love in Italy. I think it was at um, Peter Pan. And it was an instant hit. I've done, besides Father, which Father, the original Father was like an a, a Afro house kind of record. And it turned into this other thing that wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> so... Um, I came up with the idea of father as, not about talking about somebody's father, but, it's, but, but about the higher power. So without saying God, without saying something, it's just father as a father figure. When it comes with Janice, we, we, we have great chemistry. Um, I give her ideas and, and we work well together. We have another track, we have two more tracks. We have another one called Love is in the Atmosphere that is absolutely amazing. And imagine, I've done this record two years ago and nobody has heard it. I really don't play it out. And then the new one we have is Freedom, which is like epic. Um, we, do, we do great records together. They're timeless, they're very spiritual, without going over the top. You know what I mean? They always have some sort of, always a message. Great musicians, great singers on it. And so, because she's been on X Factor, so I, we cannot release any of those records until another three months, unfortunately. So people are gonna have to wait.
you know, I've had Death Mix for a very long time. We've done some great things here, you know, with Frankie Knuckles, Satoshi Tommy. You know, it was an era. You know, we did we did 30 years, which is really a lot for a company. We're actually an independent record company that really, or brand that dedicated to club music and to the dance floor, basically. And the rhythm really is just me moving forward and creating something new on a global level. You know, whereas what I did before was more classic house kind of things, you know, and with the rhythm, it's about making global music. Um, we want to concentrate on, on songs, of course, new artists, and not just soulful house music per se, because there's, there's, mu there's so much music out there, there's so much great talent out there, and I'm, I'm, I want to, I think the rhythm, I want to send the rhythm to make worldly music. I have many. I have years. It's funny because today, kind of like ironic because today I had a Frankie moment. Frankie's a very sensitive subject for me. Um, so bear with me. Um, I guess one of the funniest stories we've had, um, I remember when we first came to Italy and, uh, and we had a driver that he spoke no English. It was me, Frankie, it was John Brown, and, and our tour manager at the time, and this poor guy that spoke no English whatsoever. So we get in, so we're not staying at the hotel. I've never seen Frankie get really upset. I was, I was always the one that would be the bad guy with the attitude. Frankie was always so sweet, so soft. You know, Frankie was a teddy bear. It was the first time I ever told, saw Frankie told somebody he was gonna punch him in the face. I was like, whoa. And so we went to, to some uh, rotonda and the guy was going like this and we finally stopped. I get out of the car because I needed to take a break because it was all of us in the car. In one car, there was five of us. And, you know, Frankie and John were two big guys and I'm in the back with them. And, no, with, anyway, so the guy, I get out the car and the guy starts to leave and Frankie's yelling at him, but what about David? You're leaving David behind. You're leaving David behind. It was like, yo, it's like, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? So we're driving on the highway. There's burning cars on the highway. We finally get to, to, uh, to Reno. Now we're supposed to stay at this hotel and leave to drive from Torino to Milan the next day. We come to the hotel. The name of the hotel was Four Star, but it was a one star hotel. We arrive, there was one guy that does everything. He had some, he had glasses that look like this. Okay, we call them Coke bottles. So <laughs> it's dark and we go in. And then, so we go to the rooms. I'm the first one. It's this really shitty hotel. I'm the first one to go inside the room. It was like so nasty. I ran out, I was like, stop, stop. Everybody stop. We're not staying here. We're leaving. Don't unpack your bags. Don't do nothing. We're gone. So that was just one of, one of. I mean, I mean, we've had so many over the years. And it's funny because I look at a picture that somebody sent me today. That's why I got kind of like emotional. And you know, whenever you see a picture of me and Frankie, it's like we look like a couple. <laughs> Frankie was always good for a hug. But it's like, it's, it's those moments that it's like, and when I look at them, it, it's like, I can't, you know, people put up things on, on social media with his voice and in interviews. I can't look at him. I can't hear, I can't hear his voice. You know what I mean? And it's funny, it's what, four years now? It's, it's, it's been four years. But it's almost like yesterday, I mean, you know, we created something together and we were spiritually a team. You know what I mean? As, and and that's, that's just how we were, you know what I mean? And his passing really, um, it affected me in many ways. And he was, we were all, and we were, we were death mixed. It was Dave Mraz and, and Frankie Knuckles. So really losing Frankie, it wasn't just losing a friend or brother. It was also 
losing someone that was part of me creatively. Even though we didn't make music all the time, but we just bought it together. 